is college the only way? You already know mm. that the answer has got <laughs> to be no. But we're going to use that question as a segue to talk about some important issues in education. Do you have to be a genius to make it without college? Do you need a degree to succeed in today's world? Is the college environment the best place for networking? And if you do choose to opt out of college, how do you deal with the challenges that might arise along the way? What's your backup plan? Do you even need one? These are the kinds of questions that come up when we talk about higher education and its alternatives. And so today, Brother Kamal and I are going to rap about it. How's it going, my man? It's going good. I think this is uh, just a conversation where me and you have a, a lot of overlap in terms of our beliefs. Um, and both of us, just for some context, came, uh, well, I came through and then you kind of invented uh, this college alternative uh, co slash career accelerator called Praxis. Um, and what really made me interested in, in wanting to talk about and have this conversation was uh, you recorded a series of videos called TK's College Tour of Bad Arguments, where you hit up different college campuses and you essentially talked about, you know, all the things that you guys hear who are incoming into pra Praxis, different applicants and, and people who, you know, are, are wrestling with this question. You know, I know you have a lot of experience over the years of young people asking you, like, is college the direction for me? Um, you know, how can I be a self-taught learner? And I think that's what I'm excited to talk about is I think a lot of people, you know, when they get out of high school, they see their options as I have to either go to college, I have to go to the military, or I just have to get a job. And honestly, none of those things I think sound appealing, especially to me coming out of high school. And so I think there's ways that you can look at each of those different avenues and find ways that you can reinforce the principles of being a self-directed learner, of teaching yourself, of, of learning through experience and, you know, discovering who you are and what makes you come alive. So that's what I'm hoping to get out of this conversation, just more in depth on that and more um, more options for people who are who are facing that challenge and 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 just a paradigm shift that I think a lot of people need. Yeah, man, absolutely. Well, I'm looking forward to diving in uh, a couple of things here. So first, I want to give credit where credit is due. Praxis is the brainchild of Isaac Morehouse. I played a very pivotal role early on in, in the development of Praxis in terms of helping flesh out the curriculum, introducing the concept of coaching and advising and that sort of thing. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and say that's his brainchild. And uh, I, I, I helped a lifelong friend get that idea off the ground and 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 uh, create some game-changing conversations on what the future of education can and should look like. Regarding the tour of, of Bad Arguments for College that you uh, reference, I, I've done a few interviews on those, and it's interesting because the name kind of makes it sound this way. Um, a lot of people kind of thought that this was a series where I go around on campuses and I pick on people who go to college by saying, what's your argument for going to college? And then when they tell me, I pick it apart and show them how bad it is and make them feel really stupid for going to college. But it actually had the it was actually the opposite. It was about arguments that people use to tell people that opt out of college that they are making a bad decision. And so I addressed mm. it in that context. And this is an important distinction for me. Because I think in order to have a clear-headed discussion about college and its alternatives, we've got to be honest, of fact, uh, honest about the fact that these conversations are not happening on equal footing today. That we do not live in a country where people believe like, hey, you know, college is good for half the people. College is bad for the other. College is bad for the other half. We live in a world where most people, from the time they begin school are conditioned to think about college as an indispensable component of professional success and living a full adult life. And so the idea that you may be able to make it without college or the idea that a college alternative might actually be better for many people out there, that's still the underdog. 
it's the underdog that's gaming, gaining a lot of momentum, and it's not as much of an underdog as it was, you know, five years ago, but it's still somewhat of an underdog. And so, you know, whenever I talk about this, I always have people that go, well, wait a minute, TK, do you believe it's also okay for people to go to college? <laughs> and I say, of course it is, but we already have most people growing up in a world where every adult in their life, or at least the overwhelming majority, are telling them that it's not only okay to go to college, but it's necessary for them to go to college. And so um, in the name of keeping it balanced, we have to recognize that the conversation is already imbalanced. And so I'll be speaking from that context. But anyway, man, you, you put together some I points. Also, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah, I, well, I just wanted to say that I think when I was making that transition myself, and, and one of the reasons that did drive me to go to college was that a lot of times people frame college as the necessary uh, step that you must take in order to be successful. And I think young people, ambitious people who are committed to realizing their best version, their fullest version of themselves, often are led to believe that this is the most direct path to do that. You know, I know I very much fell under that. Um, and as somebody who looks up to my elders, who looks up to, um, you know, people who guide me and mentor me, I, I, tr I just trust their judgment. You know, I, I trusted my guidance counselors. I trusted, um, you know, my parents. And, and I think most times, like, that is the best thing to do. Um, but what I would say is that I think where I am today, which I would define as successful in my eyes, um, came from me putting myself out, from me taking risk, from me uh, getting uncomfortable, you know, from, from me just putting myself in situations that I had to get resourceful and I had to uh, find my way, you know, and, and I think there's something about that that is indispensable. You can't just replace that uh, with a four-year track of sitting in school. There's a certain level of risk that I think is necessary when it comes to any endeavor or pursuit of success. And I think that message is missed a lot when people uh, talk about college because a lot of times when they talk about it, they're promising this end goal or this end status that you will achieve. Um, and I think for myself and a lot of people who've gone through college, the two seem to be connect disconnected. The experiences aren't the same because once you get in college, you're like, wait, are is what I'm learning? Are you sure that this is going to apply to life? Because it doesn't sound like it. It sounds like an extension of high school, which I was learning pointless things that I will never use in my life. It just sounds like an extension of that. It doesn't really sound like I'm learning the real world stuff. And so, again, this is one man's opinion. Um, however... I, I think for people who are ambitious and, and people who are, uh, you know, in pursuit of that end goal of, you know, etern internal success, you know, career success, um, financial success, I, I think it's important to be able to open your mind up to realize, you know, A plus B doesn't necessarily equal C, that there's a lot of different variables that can get uh, put in that equation for you to get to that end goal. This is why beginning your decision making process with the question of what do I want, what is my goal, is so important versus asking yourself, well, what's the right way for me to go? Or what did my parents do? Or what are all my friends doing? Because you can't know what's right for you unless you know what you want to do. So as an example, in any discussion on college alternatives, um, you're always going to be reminded by someone who says, hey, hey, man, there are some careers where in order to legally practice them, you have to have a degree. And people will point out, if you want to be a medical doctor, if you want to be a lawyer. And, and this is why you can't address questions like this with blanket cookie cutter answers. Like, no one should do X. Everyone should do X. You got to stop and say, okay, well, let's talk about the individual. Is it your goal to be a medical doctor in this country? Is it your goal to go work at a hospital? Is that your dying wish to go be a CPA? Is that your life calling to go, you know, be a lawyer or whatever it may be? Then you've got to think about the things that are that are going to be relevant to the goals that you have. Um, it's just like if someone says, you know, I want to be a Hollywood actor or I want to be a musician. Well, there are approaches to education that are truly going to be a waste of your time and money. 
and there are approaches to education that are going to be very valuable to you. So what do you want to do? And I think the fundamental problem with how college is approached today is that the only people that are challenged to think really critically and deeply about what they want to do, what their contingency plan is, if things don't work out, what are all the different options and all of that are the people that choose to opt out of college. Because when you opt out of college, you worry people, you concern people, you're taking a path that requires a lot of personal responsibility and creativity. And so everyone in your life is going to ask you tough questions. You're, you're not going to be the kind of person who says, I'm not going to college without people being like, well, what do you want to do? Well, what if you don't like that? What if you find yourself in a position where you want a promotion and people withhold it because of a degree? You're going to have to think very deeply about a lot of tough questions. On the other hand, going to college is kind of like this unquestioned rite of passage. And so it's easier to take that rite of passage without challenging yourself to answer the hard questions. You know, so when someone graduates high school and they say, hey, guys, I just got accepted into the University of Indiana, we're not going to get any tough questions at that moment. Like, well, what do you plan on majoring in? Well, what happens if you get a degree with that and you don't get a job afterwards? You're not going to get that. You're going to get celebration. And I'm okay with that. But I think the most important thing is for everyone to realize that they need to think critically about the path they take. Going to college, not going to college, no one should get a free pass from challenging themselves to think about what mm -hmm. their goals are and what's going to most effectively help them create those goals. So just a little bit of setup stuff, just a little bit of context. Yeah. I got one more point I wanted to get in here before we get into the to the discussion points. What I like about approaching this conversation with, you know, the mindset of thinking like an individual, of making a decision that is in accordance with, you know, your priorities and, and the things that are important to you is opting out of college for me. And I, and I, let me pause there and highlight that phrase because I, I give credit to you and Isaac. Um, that was the first time I ever heard that opting out instead of dropping out uh, where it gives this connotation of failure uh, that you opted out of this system that didn't serve you. And I think that really resonates uh, or at least should resonate with a large percentage of, of our audience who opt out, I think, of a lot of systems that don't necessarily serve them, whether that's, um, you know, specifically in politics or, you know, in, in other systems that they find themselves um, kind of shuffled into or, or nudged into because that's how, you know, the systems naturally work. It's a natural progression. Like you need to go and do this because that's what us as a society have deemed the thing to do. And I think for me, a, you know, a personal experience Opting out of college, I think, was the first time in my life where I did take personal responsibility because at this point, I no longer can blame it on the system. I no longer can blame it on my parents. Um, I no longer can say, well, you know, I did what I was told and it still didn't work out. And, you know, boohoo me like the, the system is broke. I think daring to be different, daring to, to go against uh, conventional wisdom was one of the best experiences that I think I could have ever had as a young adult because it gave me the confidence to do that again and to do that again. And I think there is going to be more opportunities in life where I'm presented with that same situation where do you just kind of go along because that's what everybody's saying or do you make this decision to bet on yourself, you know, to find ways uh, and, and give yourself space and resources to figure it out on yourself. You know, I, I think a lot of people um, are often sold this fallacy that they're not capable of doing it, that it's unsafe somehow to bet on your own intelligence. It's unsafe uh, to, you know, <laughs> to believe in yourself, essentially. And, you know, making that decision to think for yourself at an early age, I think, really sets you up uh, for a life of possibility because you've chosen to do that. So, you know, that that only gives you the power and the air under your wings to do it again. I think everything you just said has a special meaning for me as a black man in America, because every day I'm presented with the choice. 
Do I accept statistics about what I am likely to do and become as the final say on my life? Or do I choose to create a new reality? Do I choose to respect that possibility and that power in my life? Because if I just go by the statistics, I know where I'm going to end up. I know how I'm going to end up. But I have to respect that ability to create a new statistic, respect that ability to create a new pattern so that the next generation can come along and say, hey, something else is possible that I never considered. Something else is possible other than what my parents lived or other than what my parents deemed to be necessary. And I think when you see the world through that lens and, and, and you are reminded of that every single day, that you have this choice to become the statistic or to create the statistic, then it's easier to transfer that way of thinking into other things. And so I've never been the type of person to make my decisions based on like, oh, only a small number of people have ever succeeded at that. Or, hey, everybody who did this, they succeeded. Like, I never assume that I'm going to be happy with something just because other people are, that I'm going to be successful at that just because they are, or that I'm going to fail at something just because other people have bad experiences. You want to take a look at their good and bad experiences, see what you can learn from them, but understand that ultimately you are an individual. You've got to create your own path no matter what it is you do, you know? Let's dive into these points, man. No one will take you seriously without a degree. I'll take you seriously. <laughs> you know, this, this is an interesting one. And there are a lot of people who believe this. No one will take you seriously without a degree. And there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of someone who wanted to be taken seriously. And someone did not take them seriously because they didn't have a degree. And so we wanna be honest about that. We wanna acknowledge that. We don't wanna accuse all of those people are, are lying. There are lots of people out there who know what it's like to have someone or even multiple people refuse to take you seriously without a degree. I wanna say two things about that. First of all, the opposite is also true. There are also many people out there who will choose to take you very seriously in spite of the fact that you don't have a degree. So this is not a universal thing. But here's the most important thing. It's not about the presence or absence of a degree. It's about the presence or absence of something about yourself that is compelling. If you have something about yourself that is compelling, people will take you seriously, point blank, period. Something that Isaac often has said is that if a degree is the most impressive thing that you can say about yourself, then you definitely need one. But you want to be the kind of person for whom a degree is the least impressive thing that you can say about yourself. When you look at people that are accomplished in life, people that have started businesses, people that have done impressive things, they don't lead with their degree. You know, if, if we had Paulo Coelho on this show right now, are we introducing him, you know, by where he went to school and got his degree? I don't even know where the brother got his degree. And, and, and I don't even know if he has one. I'm going to assume that he does. But if he came on the show and says, you know hey, what? hey, guys, I don't have a degree, would we care? We're going to lead with the alchemist, right? It's it's so funny that because, I you know, we're both NBA fans. And I find it hilarious that when a LeBron or when a Kobe walks out, they talk about their high school like that has anything to do with the five championships that they won over the course of their career. Like the results that they create is so much greater. And it, it always boggles my mind. Like why, why is their high school relevant? Why do they get the credit? But go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. And, and someone's, someone's got to be listening to this thinking, okay, guys, you're oversimplifying this. I mean, sure. A Kobe Bryant and a Le LeBron James can make it without a degree. A, a Mark Zuckerberg or Steve Jobs can be taken seriously without a degree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can make a million dollars or be one of the best basketball players in the world, you can be taken seriously without a degree. A couple of things. First of all, there are people in this world, and, and you got to get out if you don't recognize this. There are people in this world who have degrees and nobody takes them seriously. Let's just be clear on that. Okay. <laughs> Let's be clear on that. I, I know many of these people personally, and if you're honest with yourself, you know many of these people personally as well. There are lots of people who feel very disempowered. They feel picked on. 
they feel bullied, they feel unhappy because no one respects them and no one takes them seriously, okay? Um, people that have no degrees do not have a monopoly on that. Lots of people in this world that aren't taken seriously in spite of not having a degree. But I think what this concern misses is an understanding of why degrees are considered valuable by anyone in the first place. The reason that degrees have ever been considered valuable isn't because in the book of Exodus, God dropped down a degree from heaven and said, thou shalt have one if thou wouldest desire a successful professional life. That's not how we got the degree system. The way that we got this is because people needed some kind of signal. They needed some kind of way of knowing that you have the potential to create value. People need a filtering mechanism to avoid wasting their time. And this is a legitimate need. If, if I'm hiring someone, there might be thousands of people applying for the position. No one has an infinite amount of time. We need a way of being efficient and some kind of filtering mechanism to say, all right, I'm going to not even look at these or I'm going to let these people through. Some kind of filtering mechanism is important. And the degree has evolved into the kind of filtering mechanism that has primacy in our society. And that's beginning to change. The important thing to remember, however, is that it's the signal, not the symbol. The symbol is the current thing that is functioning as a signal. But the signal is whatever it is that shows you know how to create value. You know how to solve problems for people. And one of the things that the Praxis model has proven time and time again is that if you have a way of showing people that you can create massive value for them, if you have a way of signaling that, they will take you very seriously, even without a degree. So this is no longer a philosophical argument. This is no longer a matter of theory. This is no longer a matter of me trying to use logic to convince you uh, based on hypothetical reasoning that you can be taken seriously without a degree. We are now in a generation where we have thousands of stories from the last three years alone not limited to praxis, not limited to Lambda School, not limited to coding boot camps. We have thousands of stories from the last few years alone of people who did not have degrees or who had them and weren't being taken seriously that were able to develop some skill and build a portfolio that caused people to say, oh my gosh, I don't care about the degree. I care about your ability to create value. And now that I see you can do that, I want to work with you. This is why Ernst & Young said they are going to remove the degree requirement. I believe they did this about five years ago, saying that wow. they see no correlation between a degree and success. They just want to see some kind of evidence that you can create value. And Google has done the same thing. So the trend is in that direction of people entertaining alternative signals. And there's no doubt that as we move forward in the future, it's going to be more and more like this. I saw a quote from Ed Lattimore yesterday and I think it speaks to the point I want to illustrate, which is half the game is knowing which games not to play. To me, I think when it comes to going about something that you are going about a an avenue, a path that you're taking some risks, that you're betting on yourself, um, I think you've got to be smart with how and where you apply your energy. I think it's okay to, and necessary, not just okay, I think it's necessary to look up and recognize which are the games that I am most likely to succeed at and which are not. And play the games that make sense for you to play. And it just like you made the decision or you're considering making the decision to opt out of the institutions that aren't really creating value for you, don't play the games that aren't going to create value for you either. You know, we, we live in a world of infinite possibilities, and I think half the battle is knowing which games to play and which games not to play. And just because your parents or uh, your school or your friend's parents or your community or whomever tells you that these are the games you need to play, that is not the games you need to play are the games that internally you feel that you have the best option to or the best possibility to win at. And so when you're approaching this process, it's important to do some research, you know, find some case studies of people who were able to, you know, go through the process who had similar situations, similar circumstances at you, and that you can see a path for success on the other side of it. And I think 
to the ability to the degree that you're able to do that, I think you're making a safe bet. It might not be the bet that everybody else deems as safe, but you're still making a safe bet and it's worthy of pursuing. In terms of people uh, not, you know, giving you respect or acknowledging you or, um, you know, giving you a chance to prove yourself because you don't have a degree, I think that also is a game that you do not have to play. You don't have to play uh, those kind of games where that is the norm, especially nowadays. I think, you know, this argument would have a little bit more weight uh, 10, 20 years ago. But nowadays, there are thousands of cases where people have trailblazed without a degree. I mean, you know, you look at this next generation coming up, Gen Z, and and you look at how much change that they've uh, implemented, how much uh, how big of a voice they have, how much influence they have had on, you know, these very established uh, institutions like politics and religion and culture. I mean, this is a very, um, you know, uh, loud and proud and an unafraid generation who is willing to speak out and make change. And a lot of them are doing this from their high school, from, you know, from, from their cell phones and 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 they're making they're making it happen and so i think this this notion that you're not going to get respected without a degree um is is largely about what games that you're going to choose to play and the rules that that those games entail because there's a lot of games out here a lot of paths a lot of avenues to success uh that you make your own rules that you bring your own thing to the table. That, f- for the most part, is an industry that uh, is 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 a blank slate and takes a lot of innovation. And so, I think if you approach, you know, your life and your career that way, um, very innovatively, I don't think you have to opt into the games and the systems that you know only give your value and give you your worth based off of you know your degree or any accolades that you have. Yeah, man, those are real good thoughts. I I, I just wrote something yesterday where um, I said, when you're thinking about a job, don't just ask yourself, how much do I make? What projects do I get to work on? Who do I get to work with? But also ask yourself, who am I becoming in the process of doing this kind of work? And I, I think it's so important that we transcend the pick me mentality and that we don't look at the process of looking for work as if the power is entirely in someone else's hands. I'm just this desperate, valueless, powerless lackey that will be happy to accept whatever it is I can get. And I'm going to jump when other people say jump. I'm going to do everything that they want me to do without thinking about what's good for me. Even if you are in a place where you don't have a lot of experience, even if you are in a place where you are still focused on increasing your value, you don't have to be entitled about your needs in order to have some self-respect. And a part of having self-respect is when other people make demands on you, you don't just ask yourself, how can I meet that demand? You also ask yourself, do I want to be with the kind of party that makes this sort of demand on me? I I did a workshop with, uh, sponsored by the NAACP with a lot of uh, black college students. And one of the things that kept coming up is things like how we wear our hair, right? Black hair is a kind of a different kind of issue in the workplace, in majority white spaces, right? And and, and, and there was a lot of discussion around, hey, what about certain companies that have a problem with the way that I wanna wear my hair? You know, I I wanna wear my hair, you know, in dreads or whatever it may be. And one one of the responses that came up was, do you really want to work for the kind of company that says, I have a problem with your hair. Now, you may be the kind of person who says, you know what, I don't really care about my hairstyle. I'm willing to shave my head or let other people have a lot of say on what my hairstyle is. And you know, I just I just value having the money and having a job, so I don't really care. And, and, and if that's the way you want to play the game, that's totally your right. However, you also have the right to say, I'm going to eliminate from consideration and contention any companies that require me to be something that I don't want to be because I don't want to hate the person that I'm looking at or hate the person that I'm becoming 
just because I'm catering to demands that don't reflect my value system. And so when, when we talk about things like they won't take me seriously without X, whether X be a degree or mm. anything else. You don't just want to jump into, oh, well, I guess I better go satisfy condition X because this party over here won't take me seriously. you got to start with, well, who's the person that I want to be and who are the kind of people that I want to work with? Because it may be the case that I want to work for companies that don't care about that because I personally don't see that as being where the value is. So I'm going to look for companies that reflect my value system, for companies that make hiring decisions based on hard work that make hiring decisions based on creativity and other things. Because even if I do have that degree, I wanna be working with the right kind of people. And a company that says, I won't take you seriously without it, might not be the company for me. So that's something that you've gotta think about. I wanna say one more thing. Be very careful with telling yourself a story that you are not being taken seriously in life because of some other story that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten other people told you. I'm gonna give a dating analogy. Somebody says, Yeah, man, uh, women don't take me seriously because I'm not good looking enough. Women don't take me seriously because I don't have enough money. Women don't take me seriously because I'm not funny enough. It's easy to tell yourself stories like that. It's much harder to know that those stories are true. Even if you've got like 10 people who flat out tell you, hey, I'm never going to date you because I don't think you're good looking. I wouldn't date you because I don't think you have enough money. First of all, those people are not the world. There are plenty of people who think differently than that. Secondly, it kind of lets you off the hook by endorsing a narrative like that because it, it sort of makes you the victim of a world that you don't have the capacity mm. to negotiate. Mm. And then you start to ignore all the other people that you can learn from. All of the people out there that aren't considered handsome, that are happily married to wonderful people. All the people out there that aren't mega rich, that are in amazing relationships. All the people out there that aren't comedians and aren't really funny, that are in happy relationships. And in order for you to learn and be successful, you've got to be able to identify the kind of person you want to be and then extract lessons from people that have proven an ability to succeed while being that kind of person. And if you get caught up in these narratives like, yeah, I guess I'm failing at life or not being taken seriously because somebody over there told me that I don't meet condition X, you rob yourself of that opportunity to learn. Mm. I wanted to go back to the point that you made a little bit ago um, and wanted to play devil's advocate. And by by asking a question, you know, as a young person, because I think what's often, uh, you know, presented to, to people who aren't really well versed in maybe the alternative education space or who don't know a lot about, you know, building a career um, or or even thinking entrepreneurially is it doesn't seem like there's like a lot of options. You know, you talk about all these companies who might accept us, you know, for the different hairstyles we wear and, you know, our own cultural identities and not having to conform to this corporate uh you know, approach to business or, or to having a job. But, you know, when, when you're in school, even when you're looking at colleges, you know, all you really hear about is companies like Ernst & Young and, and a lot of these really big uh, corporations, a lot of the Fortune 500s and Fortune 100s, and that's what's defined as prestigious. That's what's defined as the goal to go after. So, you know, how do you expand your awareness in terms of what's really possible uh, when, it, you know, the people who are set in the mark for you or the people who are, uh, you know, telling you what's out there may not be giving you the right information. Yeah. First, I'm glad you used the word seems when you said it doesn't seem like there are a lot of options because that truly is just a matter of appearances. There are a lot of options. And we, we see that with Ernst & Young. We see that with the do several dozen startups that companies like Praxis work with. We, we see that with Google and what they're attempting to do with alternative certifications, their recent announcement of getting into the alt higher ed space. And we're going to continue to see that so that it becomes more and more apparent that there are a lot of options. But here's what I'd say about options. There are two kinds of options in life for anything, not just education, for making money, for 
um, following a dream, for building amazing relationships. Two kinds of options. One, the kind that are obvious. The kind that don't take a lot of effort and work and creativity to see. The kind that you can discover just by asking your Uber driver or asking your neighbor or um, you know, getting on the internet, Googling something and coming up with an answer for 10 minutes, in, within 10 minutes. And let's be clear, the majority of people of every age and every stage truly do prefer those kinds of options because it's easier, it's more convenient. And you have an option in life to prioritize those kinds of options. The second kind of option would be options that are non-obvious, options that require a considerable amount of time, effort, research, and even discomfort to discover. Options that require you to seek things out, to seek people out, to ask questions and be deliberate. Those options tend to be more rewarding, but because of the basic investment principle, risk and reward are correlated. If you want the highest kinds of rewards, you got to be willing to take stronger risk. And so each person has to decide for themselves what kind of options they want to prioritize. Now, there are areas of my life where I don't want to do a lot of thinking and working. There are areas in my life where I just want to find, you know, somebody in less than five minutes and say, tell me what to do. But I'm willing to take ownership of that. I'm willing to take responsibility for my outcomes. I'm never going to blame that person because I know that I'm basically mailing it in for the sake of, you know, convenience and being able to focus on things that are higher priority. But then there are other areas of my life where I don't want anybody telling me what to do. There are other areas of my life where even if it takes me two years of research, I'm making this decision based on me going in depth and studying it and thinking critically about what I want and making sure it's consistent with my priorities. And this, this framework applies to education as well. Um, I think the best investments, the most rewarding careers are the kind that come from looking for the non-obvious options. And so this isn't a matter of what I think you ought to do for people that are listening and making education decisions. I speak to this generation of people that aren't satisfied with traditional jobs. This generation of people do not seem to be satisfied with following the roadmap that their parents follow. They want more freedom, geographical freedom. They want more financial freedom. They want more creativity in the workplace. They want more say over the kind of projects that they work on and who they get to work with. And I think that's a totally cool thing to want. And I love that about this generation. And I would say, oh, OK, that's cool. But you're asking for something that requires you to prioritize options that are non-obvious. And so you got to be willing to do the work for that. You got to be willing to seek for that, you know, and. That's that's just not the kind of thing that's going to come from your Uber driver in the same way that if you really want to know the best, most profitable investments, you're probably not going to get it at a level of research that says hop into an Uber ride and be like, what do you think I should invest in, man? You're going to have to be able to do some looking. Mm, that's a really good answer. Let's go to the second one, man. You need college to build a good network. I definitely have thoughts about this, but man, I'm curious about you because with your experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I have thoughts about this for sure. Um, so I, I, I think when it comes to options and, and just awareness about what's out there, what's possible, I think this is one of those uh, stories that we're told, one of the benefits that I think uh, colleges often use in terms of recruiting, in terms of uh, maybe some of their admission flyers and promo that, you know, we have this great, uh, this great, you know, body of alum, alumnus, people who've graduated the college uh, and, and, and they, you know, this is the network, this is the family that you get to tap into, yada, 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 yada. First of all, uh, I went, I, I did go to college and I have a lot of friends who graduated college and I know for a fact that many times the college that they went to does not get them a job, does not get them, you know, an opportunity. It, it is literally a badge that they can put on their LinkedIn or their resume. Um, and just depending on how spirited the school is that might open some doors. Um, but 
you know, just going to any old college does not guarantee um, that you're going to get admitted to wherever you want to go. Um, I, I think what in, in general, when it comes to building relationships, when it comes to networking, uh, it's not one of those processes that you get to passively sit back and it all works out for you because, you know, you pay, you pay to play, you pay to get into uh, a certain group or institution. Uh, it's an active process. You know, if you are dating somebody just because, you know, you buy them Valentine's gifts and you take them out for dinner um, does not mean that you're going to have a successful relationship and or marriage and or anything else to come. Uh, it, it's an active process of pouring in to the person and to the relationship and building. And I think the same is true for networking um, that if you are a part of a college and you do want to build a good network, that responsibility is on you. It's not on the institution. It's not on any of the clubs that you've joined. The responsibility falls on you to go out and build those relationships. And I think the same opportunity is possible for people who didn't go to college. There is a lot of groups, networking groups specifically, that take a little bit more research that aren't just readily available and that your Uber driver is not going to tell you about, but that are out there to, to help you get connected with other young people. And I think the key to networking for me, it's, it's one going in it to see how you can create value for somebody else. Like how, how can I serve you going in it with the servant mindset? It's not, I think a lot of people think, you know, let's swap business cards and then, you know, you're just going to hit me up for business. And, uh, now I'm going to hit you up for business and, 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 something's miraculous is going to happen here. I think anybody who's been to any conference or any kind of networking, anything knows that swapping business cards doesn't mean a damn thing. Um, it, it, it's the most important aspect to relationship building is the personal touch is the relational approach is cultivating, uh, this, this, understanding this connection and this empathy with somebody else and seeing how can we work together for a mutually beneficial, um, you know, end result that doesn't necessarily have to equate in something profitable, but it is a matter of exchanging resources with somebody. How can I connect you with some, some to somebody else? How can I, you know, position you to succeed? And I think when you approach it, that way, there's this old saying that givers gain. So if you if you're if you're approaching it with this giving mindset, I think the law of reciprocation is naturally going to work in your favor, um, and that you're going to be able to to work your network, to build your network, and to prosper because of it. But so for people who haven't gone to college, I think there are tons of networking groups out there, like BMI. Um, you know. Depending on your 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 local area, there there's tons of local networking groups that can work for you, but I think you 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 really need to switch just the way that you're thinking about networking in general. Because I think what this narrative, what this fallacy proposes, is that just because you go to a college means you're going to walk out with a network, and that's not the case. Networking is an active process, not a passive one. Yeah, man, right on the money. There are so many things to say about this. I mean, at first, I'll just highlight need. You need college to build a meaningful network. Sometimes when we have been pampered in a certain direction, we have been protected from the challenges and risk associated with something, or we have had other people do most of the work for us, we can become convinced that we need certain conditions in order to produce certain results. And I think the art of making friends has become somewhat of a lost art. We really do have an issue where lots of people just have no concept of how to make friends. And I think it's actually damaging to endorse a philosophy that says, well, because people have a hard time making friends on their own, we should put them in an environment where it's as easy as possible for them to make friends. The reason I think that's damaging is because easier doesn't necessarily mean better. And sometimes doing things in a difficult way is precisely what you need 
because it helps you develop skills that are going to be essential for your survival later on in life. And sometimes by making things easy for them, we hinder their ability to navigate the challenges and complexities that come later on in life. So here's the statement that I think is true about college and networks. If you live on a college campus where you are with hundreds or thousands of other people that are also your age, and even though you come from different cultural and economic backgrounds, you get to live in the same neighborhood and it's kind of like your own little world, it's easier to make friends. Because when I, look, when I was in college, all I had to do was leave my, my dorm door open and some random person is gonna walk in and introduce themselves, right? It's very unchallenging. And no, n there's no data, debate about it that if you were to just like move to a new city, you would have to do more work than that to be able to make friends and build a net network. No doubt about it, it's comparatively easier. But that doesn't mean that, it, that you need that. And that doesn't mean that that ease is in some objective sense better for you. Uh, in fact, there are aspects of that ease that can make life challenging. There are aspects of social networking that are important to learn in other ways. So take the idea of age segregation. College is a very age segregated network. And most people's concept of friendship based on schooling teaches them to think about friends mm. and peers in terms of mm -hmm. those who are of the same age. And so there are a lot of people in this world who actually find it strange, actually find it abnormal, actually find it weird to have a friend that's five to 10 years older than them or younger than them. And there are a lot of people that don't know how to interact with people like that as friends. I don't just mean as mentor, as leader, as authority figure. To be 25 and have 40 year old friends, that's a good, healthy thing. To be 25 and have friends that are 18, 19, 20, to be 50 and have a friend that's 30, like age diversity in your social network is very good for your worldview and your health. And so one of the weaknesses of compulsory schooling is they condition us to think about friends in terms of same age, same grade. Being in an environment where you have to build your own network, you're gonna learn how to transcend that because in the real world, you're probably gonna be working at a job where not everyone is your same age. You're gonna to have to get along with people Facts. that are older than you, many of whom are not even your leaders and don't have any authority in your, in your life, right? You're gonna live in a neighborhood where for the most part, it's gonna be economically homogenous. You're either gonna live in a poor neighborhood and kind of a middle-class neighborhood and kind of like an upper-class neighborhood, which is different from what you get on a college campus. And you're gonna to have to actually get out if you wanna meet people. And these are skills that are valuable, so yeah, College makes it easier to meet people in general, but there are only certain kinds of people that you're going to meet. And that doesn't mean that it's better because there are things that you should be able to do, um, skills you should be able to develop with, with your network. You know, so for me, yes, your, your career is going to be influenced by your social networks, but there are lots of things that you can do to build your networks, like going to church. Made a lot of lot of friends just from going to church. Made a lot of friends from where I've chosen to work out. Uh, in the past several months, I've made dozens of, of friends just by being interested in Bitcoin and participating in discussion groups about it. Just by being interested in basketball and participating in discussion groups about it. I've got friends that are interested in MMA or in the NBA. There are lots of things that you can do. Like when I, when I was you know in my early twenties. I spent a lot of time in used bookstores and bookstores and hardly a time went by where I didn't strike up a conversation with someone that was in the same bookstore or that was in the same section and I would make a friend, some of whom are still with me to this day. And, and sometimes those are the most valuable connections because these are people that your life intersects with in the process mm -hmm. of you pursuing or doing something that you love you know, versus, hey, we happen to be in the same environment, all taking the same vow of poverty for the next four years, while we hope that, you know, we can be out there doing what we love, you know, when we graduate. So I challenge the idea that you build a better network that way. I challenge the idea that you actually need that. But sure, if you are someone who says, I value easy as my number one priority, 
then I would agree that you're not going to have to work as hard to meet people uh, if you live on a college campus. But I actually think developing your social skills is something that you should work very hard at. And I mean, you know, as an option uh, that you may not have considered, because I know a lot of people, you know, when they graduate from high school, they do want to leave home. They want to get out and they want to have an experience as an adult, which I think is very necessary. Um, I think, you know, a happy medium is to move to a college campus where you can live off campus, but you're still uh, immersed in that culture. Um, that was one of the experiences that I had when I was transitioning out of school that I still lived in the college town for a year and all of the perks I still got to enjoy. I mean, I've even read books about some, uh, of the great minds, innovators and entrepreneurs sneaking into classes and just sitting there and, and taking in the lecture, uh, because they still lived within the community. I think that it is true and I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like post pandemic, but you know, college campuses, college campuses are rich uh, with a lot of diversity of ideas, of people, of culture. Um, and, and it is, you know, a place that I, I can see it being a good network. But to the easy point that you were making, I think whenever you pursue easy, especially when it comes to relationships and when it comes to people, um, what I've found to be true is that easy come, easy go. That, that just because something is easy does not mean that it is uh, going to be fruitful, that it is going to be around for a long time, uh, that it is going to have much substance. I think if, if you're looking to build a quality network or if you're looking to have lifelong friends, that is not an easy thing. That doesn't just happen. Um, and I think to the degree that that's your approach to building a good network, you're you're gonna you're 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 essentially sabotaging yourself um, with that mindset because and and you're gonna often face disappointment. You're setting yourself up for disappointment because people who come into your life very easily are also the same people who walk out of your life very easily. Um, and and I think that's that's a reality that you should consider uh, before taking the easy approach to anything. Absolutely. And to give a little friendship making advice, I think one of the best friendship strat friendship making strategies you can master is to not focus on making friends, but focus on giving yourself permission to do all the things that you think you need friends to do. And that's how you make the best friends. Right. Like what is what are what are those things that you hesitate on doing? You hold yourself back from doing because you don't feel like you have friends. Oh, I wish I had friends to go do this with. I wish I had friends mm, to, you know, mm. talk about this with. Go do those Word. things without the friends. And then you'll meet the kind of people that enjoy doing the things that you love to do as well. That's one of the best things you can do to make friends. It, it, it's, it's like anything else in life. When you're too direct about it, you tend to chase it away. When you're desperate, when you're direct, you tend to move things in the opposite direction. But when you tend to be a little composed about it and you say, OK, I'm not going to make that the end all be all, but I'm going to allow that to be the outcome of me focusing on something else. That part of life tends to get easy. It's like making money. You're constantly obsessed about making money. You have that aura of desperation about you and it just becomes harder to make. On the other hand, when you say, OK, I'm going to be honest with myself. I want money and lots of it, but I'm going to get there by focusing on developing some skills creating value for people. I'm not going to try to talk people into loaning me money or giving it away to me, but I'm going to solve problems for them that are very valuable. Then the money side becomes a lot easier. It's the same thing with friends, you know, just focus on you and what fulfills you, the places you want to go, the things you want to do, give yourself permission to immerse yourself in those things. And it'll become pretty difficult to not make friends. Mm. Take it from a guy that's constantly trying to spend time shrinking his friends list. All right, let's go to uh, let's go to number three. Hopefully, your friends don't hear this. <laughs> I hope they do. Some of them can eliminate themselves. <laughs> I'm trying to filter out the friends that are like, "Well, TK, I don't want to be friends with a guy that feels that way." Like, yes, you made it easy. You were the ones I needed to get rid of. 
<laughs> you were the ones that weren't true. <laughs> it's, it's like the Kobe and MJ strategy. <laughs> you threaten them, and if they're like, I like this guy, then those are the cats you roll with. <laughs> All right, I, I missed That's that third one. Let's let's take a look at this third one. Colleges are the best place to learn. Isn't it interesting with with the last one and this one? It's interesting how these discussions are becoming less and less theoretical, man. As the world around us cha- changes, you know. Um, I heard someone say about money that money is the kind of thing that you don't need to understand or even care to understand until it stops working. And then the moment it stops working, you start to Mm. ask a lot of fundamental questions about the nature of money. And there's an analogy between education and money, because right now there are a lot of different aspects of money that seem to be not working or that seem to be problematic. And you have more and more people becoming interested not because of philosophical arguments, but because the system is failing them. They're becoming interested in things like precious metals. They're becoming more interested in stocks. They're becoming more interested in discussions on sound money. Not because you force them to with your arguments, but because the world is changing in a way that forces them to acknowledge certain things that have always been true. That's starting to happen with education. Certain ideas like, oh, this is the best place to build a network, or ideas like this is the best place to learn. Those things are just being chipped away by empirical realities that are knocking at the door of anyone that isn't sleepwalking through life. This notion that college is the best place to learn, I mean, there are people that still believe that. There are people that still experience it that way. And there are people with particular interests, like, you know, you want to be a college professor, then (laughs) you know what I mean? But like, there's so many other things we are seeing now with like the masterclass model, things like the all MBA model. There are just so many alternative boot camps, classes that that offer more than just, hey everyone, here's some content online, go be on your own. There's a lot of interaction, there's a lot of coaching, there's a lot of engaging experts, thought leaders, business owners, people that make hiring decisions. And what's really interesting is once traditional school was forced to do a lot of these things on Zoom, it Mm. didn't just level the playing field, but it caused a lot of people who were skeptical of these forms of interaction to realize, wow, we can do a lot of meaningful learning online. This is not just a matter of someone someone saying, download this ebook and go do it on your own. There's a lot of support you can deliver, a lot of great conversation and community experiences and group discussions that you can deliver. And so more and more people are seeing that now and the idea that you don't need to go to a university to master new skills, to interact with experts, to get answers to your questions, to get real world experience. That idea is just beginning to crumble apart. And one of the reasons I, for the most part, don't even participate in debates about this stuff anymore is because I think the debate is being settled by reality itself. And we are just quickly getting to a place where there's just no need to debate. And there are just the people that see it now and the people that will catch up and come along in five, 10 years. But it's already been settled, man. It's already been settled. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, when I wrote this one out, I what I really was thinking about was the importance of being a self-taught learner, of being an autodidact, uh, which is a word I, n- I never heard of. Uh, until maybe a uh, two or three years ago, that that was never even talked about in school. Uh, you know, th- this concept of of identifying the things that you actually want to learn and going to learn them. Learning was always a process of you know you you need to learn what I'm giving you to learn. That that's what learning is. It's it's not a process of curiosity. It's a process of you know this is a requirement. This is what you need to do. This is what somebody else is identifying that you need to do. And so I think there is so much power in taking learning in your own hands, um, in allowing your curiosity to be the thing that fuels the knowledge that you gain and the materials that you consume. Because 
I, I, I think there's so much more freedom to be gained when you break this paradigm um, and this mindset that learning only happens in the classroom or learning only happens in school. And, and if you allow yourself to acknowledge the fact, and I know a lot of young people can relate to this, that you learn on TikTok. You learn by watching videos. You learn on YouTube. You know, you, you, you're learning all the time. And I think that might, because of, you know, schools and, and, and the way a lot of propaganda has shaped your thinking about that, you might think about that as like, oh, that's just fake learning. That's not really learning. I'm just, you know, watching some stuff I'm interested in. That is learning. That is definitely learning. You, you, are, you are gaining knowledge that is valuable that you plan to implement one day for whatever you know given capacity you're learning with it. But that is learning. Don't discount that just because you're interested in it. I think you should lean into that. And I think to the degree that you're able to, to change the way that you think about it. I know one of the best pieces of advice my dad gave me upon opting out of college it was really a promise I had to give to him was that learning, learning does not stop, you know, since you're no longer in the classroom to really embrace this idea that you are a lifelong learner. And once you allow yourself and give yourself permission to say that, okay, I'm going to set my agenda. I'm going to set my path. I'm going to decide what I want to learn. I think you you will become smarter than you could have ever imagined. Once you're able to to break out of this paradigm that, you know, the knowledge that you're being shoved down your throat or or that you're being forced to participate in is what you need to learn and and what determines if you're smart or not. Once you break that and you decide to learn the things that you're passionate about, you will become infinitely smarter than you could have ever done or become, or realize under that system. And I think that's just an important part that too many people overlook. Yeah, man. Uh, I, I often refer to the um, the model of testing in school as the interrogation model of knowledge demonstration, where you are given the assignment to learn something, and then whether it be written or oral, you go through an interrogation process where the goal is to prove that you are not lying, when you said you consumed the content, where the goal is to prove that you did what you promised to do and you paid a sufficient amount of attention to the things that were deemed important. And there are very few things in the real world that actually work that way. In the real world, you will hardly ever be in a position where you are demonstrating knowledge through the interrogation model. Unless the police pull you over and they're asking you all kinds of questions about where you were or you're the suspect for a crime. But in the real world, the knowledge that you acquire only has value in that it helps you increase the quality of your life or the quality of someone else's life, whether tangibly or intangibly. And it's kind of sad that many of us have learned an approach to learning that says learning is about becoming smart at things that other people tell me are important. And so it's no wonder that for a lot of people, learning stops when they finish school, because now there's no one else there to tell you what it's important to be smart about, and there's no one else to hold you accountable to do it. And when education has been this externally driven process, of course, it's going to be gone once the external factors leave. But in the real world, here's how it works. In the real world, you don't have a teacher that can pick the book for you and tell you what to pay attention to. In the real world, mm -hmm. you just have a problem that's nagging you. You just have an area of your life that isn't quite working. You have something going on in your heart that you don't understand. You have a goal that you're really working hard at and you're frustrated because things aren't quite coming together in a certain way. Or you have an area of your life where you want to improve efficiency. And so you go into a library or you go on YouTube or you pull up Stitcher or a podcast app and you start sifting through stuff to see if anybody seems to be talking about things or writing about things that might be of some use to you. And you have thousands of resources there and it's hard to know, like, what do I look at? The table of contents, the description, the reviews, the reputation of the authors. And this is the real work of learning. This process of identifying what you need and then somehow mapping out all of these resources that are out there and through a combination of research and experimentation, 
becoming really good at hunting down the resources that are going to give you the insights that you need to change your life. And that is so fun. That is so liberating. It gives so much hope to life to know that nothing you will ever go through is something that is unwritten about. That for any problem you face, no matter how embarrassing it may be, there are more podcasts, more articles, more books than you will ever have time to consume. So that means you haven't tried it all. That's exhilarating. And so for me, I think learning truly begins when you leave school or when you leave Mm. the school mindset. You can leave the school mindset years before you leave school. But for some people, it takes leaving school. But that's really when the learning begins, when you start to internalize this passion for knowledge. And it's not about being able to pass an interrogation. It's about being able to improve your life. You're learning with self-interest. Dude, we could talk about this last point for a long, <laughs> for, a, for a long time, for sure. Yeah, man. Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've been going for a while, bro. <laughs> We've been going for a while. So I, I think we should wrap it up here. But this might be worth coming back and doing again. I, I won't promise it. Let, let's see what the audience says. Let's see what you all say. If there are counterpoints that you want to make, questions you want to ask, devil's advocate objections, or other aspects of this you want us to to address, let us know in the comments and or, or, or email us or, or hit us up on social media. You see us here. And um, click like if you enjoyed it. Uh, Let us know what you're thinking about things. Feel free to share with a family member, friend, or even an enemy if you think they benefit from hearing it. And we'll see you next week, y'all. Peace out.